Hi everyone, welcome to the channel. I don't know if I've made this clear before, but I love Scooby-Doo. I've loved it ever since I saw the 2002 live-action movie. I also like a lot of the animated movies and the TV series and that roller coaster of movie world, and if I think about Scoob for too long, I get a stabbing pain between my eyebrows and a mysterious ooze comes out of my nose. Can you believe it's been 20 of our Earth years since this movie first made it to theatres? It doesn't matter if you can or not, I'm not here to judge. I barely have a sense of time to begin with, which you can tell from my upload schedule. I want to offer an informative view of the film and how it holds up 20 years later, but as you might have guessed, I can't pretend this isn't personal for me. I'm also not sure I want to. Scooby-Doo was a movie I really loved as a child, and the franchise was a huge source of comfort for me. I was a very nervous kid, I was scared of everything, and that lasted a pretty long way into my adult years. Even while I was so scared, I was also fascinated by all things spooky. Eventually, I was able to turn my intellectual curiosity with horror into engagement with the medium, a process that mostly involved reading horror scholarship and only watching movies in the morning so I could immediately open the curtains and look out on the harmless light of day. But until then, Scooby-Doo is what scratched that itch, giving me the spooky imagery that fascinated me and then powering through and showing me how it worked, and of course proving that the only true evil in the world is property developers. In 1968, William Hanna and Joseph Barbera of Hanna Barbera Cartoons Incorporated began work on a horror mystery show for kids. The original pitch surrounded a rock band who would solve mysteries between shows, accompanied by their dog, who was named, of course, Too Much. Under the guidance of writers Joe Ruby and Ken Spears and artist Iwayo Takamoto, the show became Scooby-Doo Where Are You, which premiered in September of 1969. Each episode would follow a similar structure. Mystery Inc. would learn about some kind of spooky happenings. They'd investigate, they'd come up with a plan, and if they spelled out the whole plan ahead of time, it would go wrong in some way. So they'd have to improvise a bit, and finally they'd reveal there was nothing supernatural going wrong, it was just a man in a mask who thought scaring the shit out of locals was the best way to maximize profits. After many spin-offs, sequels and reworkings, a live-action remake was in the works as early as the mid-90s. After years of the kind of things that happen in pre-production, the one we ended up with was written by James Gunn and directed by Raja Gosnell. It's been confirmed in interviews since that the movie started with much more adult humour, which was edited out when the studio decided that, no, this movie is definitely for children. You sort of get a behind-the-scenes glimpse of what the characters might be like and sort of all the things that are alluded to as you get older and as a young adult you realize them might have been hinted at in Scooby-Doo. Shaggy was supposed to be a stoner, Fred and Velma were both going to be gay, there was going to be a kiss between Velma and Daphne. Instead, the drugs were relegated to references that could go either way. Talk about toasted! <laughs> like, yeah, maybe, maybe they are talking about a toasted eggplant burger. Velma got a boyfriend who disappeared in the sequel in favor of, uh, this. Who's your mommy? My, my mommy? And this scene was cut where Velma sings a love song and it's like, ooh, is, is she singing to Fred or Daphne? You're just too good to be true. I'm in two minds about the changes. On one hand, the kind of jokes that would go into an edgy adult reboot of a kid's series are the kind that would age terribly. On the other hand, it's always sad when LGBT content is considered inappropriate for children. Here's a little behind the scenes thing. Originally, at this part of the script, I was gonna say either give Fred a boyfriend, you cowards, or give Velma a girlfriend, you cowards. And on the very day I finalized the script with give Velma a girlfriend, you cowards, they, the cowards went ahead and gave Velma a girlfriend. <laughs> That, that could be a coincidence, um, but I'd say there is an equal chance that I have some kind of heretofore undiscovered power over reality. Uh, and if it does turn out to be that, um, d don't worry, I promise I will not be using it responsibly. Uh, it's going to immediately go to my head. Your boy's getting corrupted by power. So what did end up in the movie? The film opens with what would normally be the last couple of minutes of an episode. Mystery Inc. are about to catch the Luna Ghost, who has been terrorizing a toy factory. They explain what their plan is, which is how you know it's going to go wrong in some way. They save the day and reveal that the Luna Ghost is actually... Oh, man, Smithers. Smithers. The creepy janitor? After the news crew leaves, the team fight about long-standing issues they all have with each other. And despite Shaggy's best efforts, they all quit. Two years later, each member of Mystery Inc. is invited to Spooky Island by its reclusive owner, Emile Mondavarius. He's hiring them to solve the mystery of what on earth is happening to the guests at the theme park. Back off my grill, son! 
Initially, they're competitive with each other, each trying to solve the mystery first, which leads them to a spooky castle. Literally, it's a, it's a ride called Spooky Castle. A series of hijinks ensue, leading to the discovery of a mysterious artifact in some kind of school slash brainwashing facility. They split up to make sense of what they've just found, and Velma has a flashback to explain the backstory to people who are just now catching up. Rappy, I told you, no urinating on deck! And then, oh no, monsters attack! But they're not the usual kind of monsters, their masks aren't coming off, Ah! Fred and Velma get kidnapped, leaving Daphne, Shaggy, Scooby, and love interest Mary Jane to take charge, which they're super duper not used to. A completely normal Sugar Ray concert occurs. Shaggy stumbles upon a vat of souls, rescues the rest of the gang, they have this whole body swapping thing that allows Velma to solve part of the mystery. Some exposition explains that the mysterious artifact allows its user to absorb a bunch of souls to gain power, but then to complete the transformation must absorb a pure soul. And then, oh no, it turns out Mondavarius is the villain this whole time! Which you can tell by these formal shorts. The power of friendship triumphs, they develop another plan, which they explain ahead of time, and that's how you know it's gonna go wrong. And then it's revealed that, oh cool, there actually is a man in a mask. Technically, a dog in a mech. Oh, this is why we had that Scrappy-Doo piss flashback. Anyway, there's a fight, Scrappy is defeated, they rescue the real Mondavarius, everyone learns something about themselves, or friendship, or teamwork, or something. Scooby-Doo was released the same weekend as The Born Identity and a John Woo movie starring Nicolas Cage called Wind Talkers. It grossed more than either of them. The Born Identity was a pretty small movie at the time, especially considering what the series became, so I'm actually not that surprised it didn't go well against Scooby-Doo. But in 2002, a John Woo movie starring Nicolas Cage was at least an exciting premise. Like, that could have been another face-off. From Scooby-Doo came one perfectly adequate sequel, which was arguably a more faithful adaptation of its source material, even if it wasn't as good. And the real identity of Ned is... Ow. Ned. It also kicked off the career of then-unknown screenwriter James Gunn, and it was Isla Fisher's first Hollywood movie. For a movie that was filmed in Australia, it really didn't have that many Australian actors in it. At least not in main roles, but honestly, that's kind of normal. Apart from Isla Fisher, the movie features a very small appearance from veteran Australian actor Nicholas Hope, the guy from Bad Boy Bobby, which you may have seen if you went to film school and the lecturer probably said something about it being important to Australian film history, but you weren't paying attention because the cling wrap scene made you feel too claustrophobic to concentrate. Nicholas Hope is one of those actors who is just kind of in everything. If you've seen an Australian movie, there's a good chance Nicholas Hope was in it. Of course he was in Blue Healers, everyone was in Blue Healers. Every actress who played Linda on Round the Twist was in Blue Healers. It's possible I was in Blue Healers. He was also in a short film my friend worked on. The casting of this movie is absolutely perfect. Unlike I Know What You Did Last Summer, Scooby-Doo actually utilizes the chemistry between Sarah Michelle Gellar and Freddie Prince Jr. Matthew Lillard also captured the same chaotic energy he had in Scream, but as like a chaotic good version, which regrettably does also tone down the homoeroticism. Linda Cardellini is so perfect as Velma that it's honestly kind of hard to see her as anyone else. <laughs> Obviously I want her to have a career outside of this one movie, but no matter what she's in, I just see Velma. Uh, and yeah, that does include the episode of Person of Interest where Reese has to convince her character not to kill an abuser and dissolve his body and lie, and like, yeah, that's Velma right there. I know a Velma when I see one, and that right there is a Velma. Gloriously, this film was released into a world without Twitter, so all hot takes had to be delivered the old-fashioned way. From Roger Ebert. In case you were curious, this is what Roger Ebert had to say. <laughs> What I can say, I think, is that a movie like this should, in some sense, be accessible to a non-fan like myself. I realise every TV cartoon show has a cadre of fans who grew up with it, have seen every episode many times, and are alert to the nuances of movie adaptation. But those people, however numerous they are, might find themselves going to a movie with people like myself. People who found, at a very young age, that the world is filled with entertainment choices more stimulating than Scooby-Doo. If these people can't walk into the movie cold and understand it and get something out of it, then the movie has failed, except as an in joke. <laughs> Holy shit, this was about a movie from 2002. This man died in 2013, he did not live to see the current phase of the MCU. I can imagine a world where this movie gets released and a bunch of weirdos accuse James Gunn and Roger Gosnell of ruining their childhoods by making the monsters real, and then someone like me would remind them that actually the monsters have been real in previous Scoobies do, such as Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. And then they would reply that Zombie Island shouldn't be considered a canonical Scooby-Doo adventure since real monsters are against the spirit of the franchise. And besides, they didn't even have the original voice cast. 
And then I'd submit that first of all, how dare you disrespect Billy West like that? And secondly, you know as well as I do that the only reason Casey Kasem didn't return is that one of the conditions for him returning was that he wanted Shaggy to be a vegetarian, but they'd already made too much progress on scenes of him eating crawfish. And ha 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 ha, we've both fallen into a trap set by a fact blore. The wizard who lurks near incorrect information to attract pedants and know-it-alls, and he traps us both in his cube. W what's that? You have something to say about his cube? Go ahead and comment about it. I'm sure there's room in his cube for you. Watching Scooby-Doo 20 years after its release, something that really strikes me is how fascinating it is to watch an adaptation of an existing property that wasn't made to set up a franchise. There was a sequel, and it's perfectly fine. It was probably responsible for some people realizing some stuff. Uh, Velma? Do you have to go to the bathroom? No, I can't mess up there. Hey, so sidebar, um, Daphne did this whole makeover on Velma in like 15 minutes, so did she just casually have a vinyl catsuit in Velma's favourite colour? Like she didn't have time to make this or recolour an existing one or even go out and buy a new one. The only possible conclusion to draw is that Daphne had this already. For reasons. My point is that the 2002 movie could stand on its own. There's nothing in it that even hints at a sequel on the way. It's amazing comparing this to all the post-Avengers movies where, like, studios wanted to kick off an extended universe, but they started at, like, one movie before whatever their Avengers was going to be, but they just kind of sucked. I see you, dark universe. Actually, this is kind of what Scoob was. It's very clearly trying to set up a cinematic universe for 10-year-olds that's full of characters that mean nothing to anyone under 40 without taking the time to make them relevant separate from this film. Ah. Oh. Oh. Ow. In all seriousness, Warner Brothers axed the sequel to Scoob when it was basically done, and I think that's some hot garbage. I wasn't going to watch it, but it still sucks that they did it. There is certainly some stuff in this movie that doesn't hold up after two decades. When we say that a movie hasn't aged well, there are a bunch of different things we might mean. We might say that the visual effects aren't up to a modern standard, and there is certainly some very 2002 CGI in Scooby-Doo. But I think what they do is mostly solid. There is certainly a lot of thought put into how practical and digital effects would work together, especially when it comes to actors interacting with something that would be added digitally. It's a bit challenging for the actors, but, but they've stepped up really well. It's just me in an empty chair. When actors get together, they have a certain chemistry. We had to create a chemistry with the other actors in Scooby, so they, they knew what he was about. School. Like, what are you doing, man? So for rehearsals, a lot of times we use, there's several factions of Scooby-Doo. Sometimes a movie ages badly because of its reception or how it lives in popular culture. Think of a piece of media where a character has a catchphrase that's been repeated to death. It's good cake. My wife made it. My wife! <laughs> <laughs> Borat. Or how a lot of people are kind of embarrassed to admit they like Rick and Morty because the fans have kind of a reputation. Speaking of extra textual factors, another thing we might mean is that someone involved in the creation of a piece of media has had some things revealed about them, or has said some stuff. But I think the main thing we mean when we say a movie hasn't aged well is that it contains jokes, archetypes, or representations that are offensive, or that you'd know to avoid if you made the movie today, or have just been done too many times. This could be benign things, like jokes that overanalyze the supernatural rules set out by a horror movie. Seven days. Seven days? Oh my god, I'm gonna die next Monday? Yes. No, wait, Monday? That would be seven business days. This is seven days starting now. So seven days to this very hour? My watch broke, how am I gonna know the exact hour? Forget hours, this day, seven days from now. But there's a holiday coming up. Do you count the holiday as a day? This is a style of joke that's just kind of old. We've heard it all before because we've been on the internet in the 2000s. At the more sinister end, it could be stereotypes about marginalized people that contribute to their ongoing marginalization. For an example, see the way that the horror genre has historically treated queer people, especially trans women, as sexually deviant villains. In this sense, Scooby-Doo has mostly aged well. Most of the jokes are either cartoon goofy nonsense, or jokes about the typical format of a Scooby-Doo episode, like how the Spooky Island is literally called Spooky Island. Because castles have paintings with eyes that watch you, and suits armor you think to statue, but there's a guy inside who follows you every time you turn around. How many times has that actually happened? Twelve. There is one quite glaring exception in the form of Hollywood voodoo. Look, what do I know? Maybe Child's Play is the definitive source on what voodoo is. It's not. Not all instances of Hollywood voodoo were equal. 
Some are benign or even pretty good, like I would argue an example is Vampires vs. the Bronx, in which a character being raised by a Haitian grandmother makes her uniquely prepared to deal with a supernatural threat. Often it's just, hey, here's a racialized group of people who can kill you with their minds. Ooh, spooky foreigners. To be generous towards Scooby-Doo, technically it's not the voodoo that's evil, but the people who appropriate and co-opt voodoo for their own gains. And you could say that there's commentary in there about how cultures get exoticized and sold to tourists in a bottled up and labeled way that doesn't respect the traditions that have been passed down through generations and have probably had to survive colonialism. All of which gets ignored by the 38 year old caftan wearing white guy in Byron Bay who calls himself a Reiki master and is trying to tell you that an Ayurvedic diet is gonna realign your chakras and fix your acne. And it's like, dude, if I want someone to dunk on my skincare routine, I will post about it on TikTok. However, that is kind of a reach. The film itself shows multiple practitioners of voodoo, but their practice is not functionally different. Nagutauna puts on a performance of voodoo to scare the tourists, and the creepy guy who lives on the beach uses voodoo to protect himself, but there's not much difference in their practice. If anything, evil voodoo is the effective and dangerous thing that must be stopped, while regular voodoo is comic relief. Hey, so uh, I wrote this bit without checking any of the character names. I, I figured I'd just change them when I did a fact-checking edit on the script, and it turns out the guy who lives on the beach isn't named, he's just listed in the credits as Voodoo Maestro. <laughs> I don't know, that feels like a, like a point to raise. Also, not all co-opting of voodoo is equal. Scrappy-Doo uses the sacred rites of a culture that isn't his to gain power and doesn't care at all about the damage this will do. But before that, the real Mondavarius is using voodoo as set dressing to scare tourists. They're both using another culture's customs for personal gain, but only one is vilified for it. And yes, of the two, it is correct to vilify the one that will get people killed, and you could probably argue that Mondavarius putting on these performances is actually helping keep a culture alive and pay the bills at the same time, but again, that feels like a reach. I want to be clear, I don't want to hashtag cancel Scooby-Doo or anyone who made it happen, nor am I writing a list of flaws just to prove that I noticed them. I love this movie, and I'm glad it exists. The reason I'm bringing all this up is that using voodoo as a catch-all spooky foreign magic, especially without taking the time to learn anything about it, is a way in which this movie really shows its age in a bad way. But hey, thinking about Scooby-Doo 20 years later also means thinking about what does hold up. So I'm going to use this last section to talk about some things I really liked on re-watching the movie for this video. I like this villain. I think he rules. To be clear, what I mean by that is that I think he's well written and functions well in the story. I really like Emil Mondavarius as a villain, even knowing the twist that it's Scrappy in a mech. He doesn't strike the gang as a villain right away. When Fred adds him to a list of suspects, he admits that he doesn't actually have any evidence apart from like a, a vaguely spooky vibe. But like, look at him, he's friendly, he's goofy, he gets close to people, and then he uses what he learns against them. Oh. The essence of Mondavarius is, is, is that he's actually a very, very nice man, and but, but very, very keen to please. But, uh, but then suddenly he can quite easily be a little bit distant. He is explicitly a cult leader. He's a charismatic figure who lures people in and then asks them to give more than they'd otherwise be willing to give. There's a strong comparison to Chris Hemsworth's character in Bad Times at the El Royale, in that even when he is evil and irredeemable, you can see what attracts people to him. Far and away, the most sinister thing Mondavarius says is, We love you, Scooby-Doo. And that's because it's setting him up to say, Scooby. I would like you to be a sacrifice. There is an extent to which media for children, more than media for any other age group, could be considered like instructional. Like it can't just be entertainment, there has to be something for kids to learn, whether it's a positive lesson or just not a negative lesson. So if we're viewing Scooby-Doo through the lens of what instructions can we gain from this, there's a bunch of stuff about like the power of friendship, but also about being aware that sometimes people are only nice to you because they want something from you, and I think that's a really good lesson. I like how tight the screenplay is. Just about every setup pays off, even the weird ones. I got a call for a Mr. Do. Uh, Melvin Do? Who oh, I need to complete my transformation is... Scooby-Doo! Wait, don't you mean Melvin do? I like the set design. They used six sound stages to make all the sets for this movie, and so much detail went into them, from the hotel to the spooky castle ride to the cave where the ritual takes place. I don't know, I have film school brain, I just appreciate a good practical effect. 
It's possible I especially appreciate it here because it was obsessing over these behind the scenes details as a kid that really got me to appreciate what goes into filmmaking. It's also possible I just appreciate it because we don't really get medium budget films anymore. I think the way they're filming the Star Wars is since Mandalorian, like where they have the volume, this huge sort of digital set generator is really cool. I think the volume is amazing technology, but like not all productions have Disney money. It just, I don't know, it just sort of seems like every movie since like 2014 has either had Disney money or has been a micro budget indie that had to shoot at the producer's house. Obviously, if a movie is bad, it's down to a lot more than whether the effects were practical or digital, but I like it when actors have something to interact with. A green screen doesn't provide enough enrichment in the actor enclosure, they need scenery to chew on. I like this fight between Daphne and the Luchador. The use of the Luchador as like a miscellaneous, faceless, foreign seeming bad guy does fall into the same category as Hollywood voodoo when you consider that, as far as I can tell, this actor is not a Luchador himself, but I, I want to focus on this fight for its choreography specifically. <laughs> I am not immune to the power fantasy of the waifish girl facing down a much larger opponent and handing his ass to him, but I appreciate it when the fight scene is at least choreographed in a way that takes into account the size difference between the two of them. It's a cartoony over the top wire fight, but it is at least grounded in that way. Zarkos is a 6 foot 2 muscle man who moves like a big guy. All his moves are about using his size to overpower a much smaller opponent. Daphne doesn't have that physical power, but she makes up for it in dexterity. Her technique is about throwing her opponent off balance, using his high center of gravity against him, and leading him where she wants him to go. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah, dude. Just fuck yeah. Come on, man. That's good. I like it. Fuck yeah. The main thing I like about this movie is what I like about any of the good Scoobies do, and that it's really kind of an exploration of fear. It is brilliant American literature. And I don't care what anybody, it is. It's lit, it should be taught in schools. These characters are cowards. They're scared. They're, you don't want them on your team ever because you would definitely be killed and lose. However, for some reason, we pull for them the whole time. Because Shaggy and Scooby are interesting characters. They're two of the most major characters in American literature. <laughs> because, and I mean this sincerely, and I think it's fantastic, because they are cowards. They are cowardly characters. They believe in cowardice and sandwiches. And, uh, and can you think of any in the whole realms of the English-speaking literature that, that are characters like that, cowardly characters that you identify with? Because you identify with, you're with them all the way. Go, Shaggy, go, Scooby. <laughs> the rest of the guys who drive the van, fuck off. <laughs> Scrappy-Doo, a magnum. <laughs> But Shaggy and Scooby, the only other character, I mean, tell me now if you can think of any other character, because I'm, I'm willing to learn, but somebody mentioned Falstaff, a Shakespearean character. It's that level of greatness. <laughs> Falstaff is a character, you sort of identify with him, but he has a melancholy with him. But Shaggy and Scooby are upbeat all the time. They say, ooh, scared Shaggy. <laughs> Scooby's <laughs> like, run, run, run. <laughs> and you love them, you're with them. There's part of us that Shaggy and Scooby at every stage of the way. Every Scooby-Doo villain is someone who is using fear to get what they want, so what Mystery Inc. brings to the table isn't so much the ability to solve a mystery, it's that fear doesn't stop them. Oh, we don't go near any place with spooky, haunted, forbidden, or creepy in the name. We're supposed to be heroes, man. So I'm gonna do what I always do. I'm gonna eat myself a Scooby snack, and I'm gonna save my best pal. They will be scared out of their minds, but they keep going because, like, what are you gonna do? Let the shady banker destroy an old growth forest to build investment properties? Fuck that, I'm gonna kick this ghost's ass. Fear in the Scooby Doo universe is not something to be conquered, but something to be managed. Bravery isn't the absence of fear, bravery is when you do the thing that is scaring you, allowing fear to pass through you until only you remain, etc. None of these characters have to fundamentally change who they are. Yes, they gain skills, but what really changes about them is that they learn to see the value in themselves and in each other. The only thing I'm good for is getting caught. But you never let that stop you before. And if that's not a true hero, then I don't know what is. Unless you consider vanity or arrogance to be fundamental to Fred's character, and it might be, but honestly, he doesn't lose that much. They're still the scared, fragile, hopeless kids they were at the start, and they're in way over their heads, but... They get through it because what are you gonna do? Just let Scrappy destroy the world? Fuck that, I'm gonna kick this dog's ass. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just a sucker for friendship. I like when a happy ending feels earned. I like when characters learn and grow together. Is there something wrong with that? I just enjoy the enduring power of love. I is that not enough for you? They learn that friendship means learning to value others and themselves. 
That everyone brings something unique to the table and pretending your weaknesses don't exist is not a sustainable plan. No man is an island. Humans are a social species. We need each other. We need to form communities and work together instead of competing with one another. And I like that Scooby-Doo makes a narrative out of that. Fight me, you nerds. Meet me in the McDonald's parking lot at midnight and we'll settle this the old-fashioned way. Thanks everyone for watching. If you like what I do, do the YouTube things, like, comment, subscribe. Um, it would also really help me out to donate to my Patreon. Um, I do have some patrons. Here are the ones who pledged at the name in big letters tier. Well, that's it from me. Stay safe. Don't go near anything with spooky, haunted, creepy, or forbidden in the name, and say hi to your pets for me.